Welcome everyone to Global Regulation Frameworks Legal Blog, this time with Steve Tenden talking about Malta. Uh, Steve, welcome and let us know about yourself and about Malta. Yes, uh, good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you Seth, for organizing and setting this, uh, this up. Um, you've probably noticed that Malta has, uh, has been a bit on the headlines during the last uh, 30 days uh, because of the events happening here and because of the launch of the new regulation. So my presentation here is about blockchain island Malta, the first crypto economic superpower, question mark. Um, let me first maybe just say two words about myself. Uh, um, I uh, discovered like the Bitcoin in 2010. My, uh, my career uh, has two phases, one as a software engineer and then as a management consultant. So I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Anything I can say will not be held against me, right? I, I have to put forth this, uh, this disclaimer. Uh, however, eh, as a management consultant, I was trying to organize my own company in terms of uh, fluid and decentralized global organization and came across uh, at a conference in Antwerp uh, in, in uh, 2000 and 15, September, October 2015, a software that was like made for me, made for managing fluid organizations. Um, the software was called Colony, and you might check that out at colony.io. It's really fascinating. Uh, and I was intrigued by the software, and the old software engineer in me asked the gentleman who was presenting it, well, how did you do this? I've never seen anything like it. And he explained that he was using something called Ethereum. And uh, I didn't know about Ethereum. Um, did a Google search in the evening, found Vitalik Buterin's white paper, and after reading the second or the third sentence, I was totally sold on this idea of decentralized computation, uh, smart contracts, and decided to get more deeply into that. In order to do so, I signed up for a course at MIT. It was a future. FinTech and Future Commerce course. Um, a part of that was on blockchain. And uh, within that, there was also a track on regulatory technologies. I did that and got an incredible assignment. The assignment was like, imagine 10 years from now that you will have designed the uh, laws, the regulations of a country completely based on blockchain. So my fantasy went completely wild. I did this assignment, I put, got a good mark, and basically forgot about it, thinking that will never ever happen. It was a nice fantasy. However, um, just a few weeks after that, I was presenting at a financial services conference. Um, I was presenting about Bitcoin and blockchain, and in the morning, I was introduced to the keynote speaker. The keynote speaker was Minister Cardona, the Minister of Economy of Malta. And uh, instead of presenting myself and my company and my, uh, my uh, management consulting services, I just took a chance and uh, I told the minister like an elevator pitch about the benefits of blockchain for a country. Long story short, I was called to his office and at the end of a long meeting, he asked me if I could draft the national strategy. I did that, it was approved by cabinet. Um, there was a new minister put in place specifically for the financial services, digital economy, and innovation sector. And the task was to transform the strategy into laws. And that's happened during this last year. The laws entered into effect like five days ago or six days ago at the beginning of this month. And uh, that's also at that event where I'm very proud that I got this uh, uh, award for the outstanding contribution to the blockchain market. So that's my short story, and I will now go on to uh, introducing the, uh, uh, the topic. I have collected here a number of, 
of links. We will maybe put them uh, in, uh, in the chat uh, afterwards. Uh, the topic, of course, is very, very deep and broad. So you will find uh, hundreds of pages to read through uh, these links. Um, they are great to help you sleep at night, unless, of course, you're a lawyer and you love this kind of, of document. Um, and uh, let's see what this is about. So we had a strategy. A strategy was made of six uh, key projects, but in particular, one was to appoint a regulator, a new kind of regulator, and another one was to regulate the space of cryptocurrencies. The six projects are, uh, um, well, four of them are actually uh, in, uh, in effect. They are, they are happening. And two more are, are like on the drawing board. One about the residency of individuals and uh, legal entities, and one about the smart governance of, uh, of the country's public services. So these laws uh, that came into effect are effectively three, the Virtual Financial Assets Act, the Multi Digital Innovation Authority Act, and the Innovative Technology Arrangements and Services Act. There is a fourth law, which is in the working. It is a draft law right now. It's, uh, it's being uh, discussed. It's not yet out for consultation, but will be pretty soon. And it's called the Innovative Technology Foundations Bill. Now, uh, here we started working on this in 2016. So this was way before the, the boom of the Bitcoin valuation in 2017 and the incredible explosion of, uh, of the ICO phenomena. Uh, those two uh, factors, I think, determined a very quick reaction from some jurisdictions like Gibraltar, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, and others that were quick to sort of regulate the financial aspects, the cryptocurrencies and the ICOs. Um, in Malta, instead, we were focusing from the outset on the broader topic of blockchain technologies, of decentralized computation rather than only decentralized storage. And uh, the cryptocurrencies were one of the six projects, and in fact, it resulted in this Virtual Financial Assets Act. Notice that this one is mandatory. It's obligatory for anyone dealing with cryptocurrencies and uh, related technologies and services to, um, to uh, be subject to, to the rules of, uh, of this law. Um, in, uh, in particular, it, it is consistent with the normal financial services laws and aims at providing investor protection, market integrity, and financial stability. It has provisions that go beyond what is required by AML 5, and it makes space for what in the rest of the world is called an ICO, and here will be called the initial VFA offering. VFA stands, of course, for Virtual Financial Assets. We'll get into that shortly. The most important part of this law is that there is a financial instrument test which decides, which helps you decide what an asset um, is, if it, if it is a, like a utility token, a security token, or this new thing that we recognize in lot of the virtual financial asset. The other two laws are, um, well, one of the Multi Digital Innovation Authority Act establishes this new authority, which uh, spans the, uh, the whole scope of blockchain technologies, which is 360 degrees. The idea here is to harmonize and create a, a uniform uh, understanding and vision about the technology, because we know that since the technology uh, can be used in a number of uh, economic fields, naturally it can be subject to a diversity of regulators' attention. We had that very problem here in Malta in, uh, uh, in the autumn of last year while we were drafting these laws. We had the Malta Financial Services Authority issuing some statements and positions with respect to cryptocurrencies, and we had the Malta Gaming Authority issuing other statements and positions which were quite opposing to those that came out of the MFSA. We, we see the same phenomenon in the US with the SEC and the uh, CF, 
FTC going in different directions. So the MDIA, the Mapa Digital Innovation Authority, is there to make sure that everyone understands what this is about and that no regulator oversteps its, uh, uh, its mandate. Notice that it is the Malta Digital Innovation Authority. It's not the Malta Bitcoin, Crypto or Blockchain Authority. It cares primarily about innovation and innovation of new technology. And in fact, the third law, the Innovative Technology Arrangements and Services Act, is there to allow the providers of this kind of technology to um, certify their technology. And uh, uh, notice that this is a voluntary regime. Why? Because we understand very well that decentralized technologies cannot be regulated. I repeat that, they cannot be regulated. And therefore, we are trying to apply the lessons of Satoshi Nakamoto, where he achieved um, the amazing feat of getting a number of people to behave in a consistent manner because they were incentivized. The miners that, that get the, the, uh, the mined coins for the services. So the idea here is to create some incentives that will um, push the, uh, the designers of technology in a certain direction. And we'll go into that uh, shortly. So some terminology, we recognized uh, DLT, uh, distributed ledger technology. Um, we have one definition which, uh, which is quite generic, but in particular, we recognize the existence of a DLT asset. Now a DLT asset can be a virtual token, which in the rest of the world is a utility token. And I would stress the fact that it is a pure utility token. It's only used to take a ride on a carousel. And then we have electronic money and financial instruments, which are known artifacts in, uh, in uh, the financial services sector, with the distinction that in this case, they can exist and can be represented on a blockchain, on a DLT. And then we have this very peculiar one, the virtual financial asset. In uh, simple terms, it is like a utility token, only that it is being traded on an exchange. Uh, however, the thinking behind this is much deeper because we see this as the element that can capture smart money, smart uh, items that have value and that are programmable and have autonomy and even self-sufficiency. So it is, it is a new kind of asset class that uh, is not recognized in, uh, in any other jurisdiction as far as I know as of today. And it can be used to run an ICO, which here we call the initial VFA uh, offering. Um, now, we will just look briefly at the Virtual Financial Assets Act, because that is the one that everyone has been waiting for. And then we will look into some aspects of the forthcoming fourth law. So uh, the uh, VFA rules recognize the role of an agent. An agent has to work with the, um, the issuer of the tokens and has some uh, uh, very strict requirements. You must be fit and proper. There is a registration fee. Uh, there is an initial and ongoing capital requirement, 75,000 euro plus um, professional indemnity insurance or 150,000 euro. Uh, the agent undergoes a test and assessment which looks into its um, experience, education, um, and um, this must also be uh, kept up during the years with continuous professional uh, education. The agent has uh, uh, ongoing obligations in terms of governance, insurance, and acting as an outsourcer for the Malta Financial Services Authority. And of course, the enforcement and sanctions. Um, the other big actor that the VFA Act recognizes uh, are the issuers of the tokens, those that want to run an ICO. Uh, they must have a board of administrators. They have certain functionaries that must be in place. 
The VFA agent, as I just mentioned, uh, is not part of that company, but comes from the outside and is authorized by the MFSA. And uh, then internally, they must have a systems auditor and uh, a normal financial auditor, um, the, uh, the uh, MRO, the custodians, and uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, professionals. Uh, the issuance of tokens must come with, uh, with uh, an application that is presented to the MFSA, a white paper, and must, must um, uh, go through certain scrutiny to see if uh, it meets the conditions of, uh, of admission. And even here, if things are not right, there will be enforcements and sanctions. And uh, the third uh, huge role is that of the service provider. A service provider could be like an exchange, could be a wallet provider, and anyone basically uh, having some sort of service that manages the, uh, the cryptocurrencies or the, the tokens. There are four classes, and the, the bigger classes have uh, uh, quite uh, hefty licensing uh, fees, up to 730,000. Euro. Even here, there are no ongoing obligations, and uh, and uh, uh, they must basically behave as uh, as any uh, operator in the financial services sector. Now, I mentioned the financial instruments test, and uh, basically, it goes through a series of questions and goes by exclusion. If it's not a virtual token, a transferable security, a money market instrument, a unit in a collective investment scheme, a financial instrument as recognized under MIFID, another derivative contracts relating to currencies or derivatives of financial instruments or emissions allowance or electronic money, then the only thing that remains is that it is a virtual financial asset. And yes, yes, we can run an ICO and get our Lambo. But it's not that easy because uh, you must present a white paper. The white paper must comply to this act, must be registered, um, cannot be published unless it has first been scrutinized by the authority and unless the agent uh, confirms to the authority that the white paper is compliant. The other requirements, but in particular, the compliance is of the white paper is quite heavy. Uh, the MFSA has identified like the best practices that we have seen in the industry and added a lot more. Here I have the first page, which uh, summarizes what uh, items and elements and sections must be in the white paper. And here's the second page. I will not read it out. You will find uh, these things in the slides or in the, in the actual acts. But as you see, this is a much higher uh, requirement on what is needed in a white paper than we have ever seen uh, before. And uh, now I want to jump to, to the fourth law because this is my own personal pet peeve. I have been pushing for this uh, since the very beginning. Why? Because the focus was on decentralized computation. And uh, we, as I mentioned, we understand that this technology cannot be regulated, uh, but we are also seeing a technology that can exist on the blockchain by itself, like the DAOs, and uh, not only can it exist autonomously, but it can potentially acquire the trait of self-sufficiency. A DAO, uh, if it is fully functional, will have its own wallet, and uh, will be presumably paying people to do things for it. I claim that the Bitcoin protocol and algorithm is the first instance of a real working DAO. And that was like the model. The Bitcoin um, protocol um, has replaced uh, settlements and, and clearing houses. And, uh, and uh, it's working autonomously and it's self-sufficient. How does it become self-sufficient? Through the incentivization schemes it offers to miners. So the Bitcoin protocol is paying the miners in order for them to keep it up and running. We probably we will probably see the same mechanism in uh, with other DOs that will be 
self-sufficient, they will be offering services and people will, uh, will pay for those services and with the, with the profits of those services, the DAO will, uh, will basically be able to, to buy and consume other services. So it becomes, um, as stated in the document of February this year, when the whole legislative framework effort was launched, it becomes possible that these entities, which we call technology arrangements, will be transacting with people, but there, there will be no real proper legal person as a counterparty. And uh, we already then were foreseeing this possibility that these technology arrangements would be able to register here in Malta with the registrar for legal person and hence acquire uh, the status of a legal personality. But of course, in order to do that, they must fulfill a number of uh, requirements. And uh, this brings us to the <clears throat> key question. If this kind of technology goes bad, who do we sue? I always make this uh, hypothetical example of asking the question, who was the smartest guy? Was it Satoshi Nakamoto or the father of Bitcoin? Uh, or was it Vitalik Buterin, the father of Ethereum? Well, we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto was. Uh, he, she, it, they, we don't know. And that clearly shows what the problem is. If something really bad happened with the Bitcoin protocol, there would be no one to go after. However, the case of the Ethereum protocol and probably the situation of most uh, projects in this space uh, have a person that we can identify and that we can uh, deem as the nearest person and thus, and thus become, becomes responsible for any malfeasances of the, of the software. The problem here is, uh, is more for, for these designers than for anyone else because being the blockchain global, um, it could create harm anywhere. And thus this person could be brought to court in other countries than, uh, than uh, where the person would reside, maybe even in countries where, where human rights are not fully respected. So that's not, not quite a nice prospect. And uh, another aspect here is the lesson from the DIO, where the initial investors after the DIO hack happened, uh, after a pronouncement of the SEC, seemed that they were those who were responsible for the theft, whilst in reality they were those who had been robbed. So you see that the possibilities of interpretations here are really contradictory. And what we are trying to achieve here is to create protection not for the technology. We understand that technology can exist out there on the blockchain and couldn't care less if some little human got damaged. What we want to take care of here is how do we deal with the people who are around the technology, whether that is the designer who creates it or the consumer who uses the services of technology, or the investors or token holders who buy into the tokens and maybe gain some rights and or expectations of profits. So what is the, the reasoning here? Why do we need a legal personality? We already mentioned the case of an, anon an anonymous designer, Satoshi Nakamoto. If something goes bad, there is no one against whom we can take recourse. But we have also the more subtle case that uh, exemplified by the Ethereum and the Vitalik Buterin, even if there is a well-known person, the nature of the technology is such that the software artifact will exist throughout all time. That's the whole notion of immutability, of permanency. So we have the problem of the extinction of the designer. Once this nearest person dies and passes away, we are back to square one. There is no one to run after. 
And of course, we have the case of the DAO. Those who bought into the DAO, they, uh, well, they need to be protected as well. So the case of consumer protection. We have a broader case of desire protection in the sense that a lot of this technology is built on top of, uh, of open source. And uh, there can be uh, thousands of designers, software engineers that contribute to a piece of open source. And it would be very uh, funny if they were brought to court because they had developed something that then at a later stage, someone else used to create a DAO and they had really no insight, let alone intention to, uh, to make any, any harm. But if we follow this reasoning that we keep on finding someone who did uh, uh, contribute to the creation of the, of the technology, we will get to this uh, absurd situation. So one concern is to protect these designers and therefore allow uh, innovation to, uh, um, to prosper. There is the case of protecting the technology arrangement itself. Why? Because if, uh, if now we have companies creating these technology arrangements and uh, uh, maybe they, uh, they uh, go bankrupt, um, well, their software could be considered as part of their assets. So they could be subject to, to claims. However, this software being on the blockchain uh, almost becomes a, a, a commons, uh, uh, something that is available to the, whole, to the whole public. So any recourse against that software could in turn uh, damage many, many more people than, than the, the, uh, the actor that was first uh, claiming something against the creating entity. So it's, a, it's like a reversal of, of logic here that we need to protect the, uh, uh, the liability going towards the company that created the technology uh, where that technology could be considered as part of, uh, of its assets. We have a problem of evolving legislation. Why? Because uh, whatever is put on the blockchain exists forever. So what exists today uh, as uh, laws evolve might become illegal tomorrow. And therefore we must give some provisions here so that this uh, software entity uh, will exhibit certain uh, behaviors, features, attributes, qualities, aspects that will keep it still a quote, quote, a good citizen as, uh, as the laws uh, evolve. Otherwise, we are creating a situation where the laws cannot evolve. And we are already seeing this with the case of the GDPR and the, and the right to be forgotten and the location of data and all these things that uh, were designed for a centralized world but uh, become uh, like uh, a problem in a decentralized uh, world. We have uh, the notion of forking, not only the forking of software, but the forking of the blockchain, uh, blockchains as such. And uh, here we are building on top one legal construct we have in Malta with the protected cell companies. And uh, that's uh, uh, with that mechanism, with that vehicle, once there is a fork, and uh, the fork is of a legal entity of a software that has a part legal legal status uh, as legal personality. Well, the uh, the new entity that is spawned off uh, would uh, would uh, take the form of a protected cell and hence become a new legal person in its own right. We have the case of jurisdiction of choice because the blockchain is global. Uh, it must somehow be able to, uh, to enter contracts and, uh, and therefore say that uh, if you want to contest my contracts, this is the court that will, will take care of that. But it's even more subtle because um, if we have services that are offered in different jurisdictions, the very service can be subject to the different laws. Like for instance, the insurance case uh, where suppose that uh, um, an insurance DAO registered in Malta offers services in Germany. In Germany, there are particular laws for the insurance. And uh, in that case, uh, with a protected cell 
structure, the software could fork in order to support that jurisdiction and declare that for that cell and for that fork, the jurisdiction of choice is Germany and thus be com become compliant to any restrictions that are in place there. We have two more very important cases, and one is this notion that DIOs will evolve and create a whole network uh, through value supply custody chains. And if I am at the end, at the periphery, uh, consuming the services of these networks, and at the other end, we have maybe Tete who's doing something else, which eventually reaches me, but some intermediary DAO or technology arrangement fails, well, then that's the first level recourse uh, against the DAO that is directly interacting with the human counterparts is not sufficient. In other words, a DAO must be able to sue another DAO. And the last one, maybe the most controversial of all, is what is happening with the Oracle's industry. The Oracle's, as I presume you know, are these uh, technologies that allow off-chain data to reach the uh, on-chain world. Typically, these are sensors that provide information read uh, from the real world to the smart contracts of a technology arrangement. And if we are in this scenario where we have DAOs which are able to dynamically through registry lookups, find oracles, and on the fly uh, enter in a, an agreement with them and get the data from these oracles, and uh, maybe one of these oracles is at fault, well, the DAO will, uh, will also be at fault. And I will sue the DAOs as a consumer of the DAO, but the DAO, who is innocent in this case, would sue an oracle. And an oracle is typically a company in the real world. So we are having this scenario where the DAO would be able to sue us humans. We were going also in the other direction. But how can we make this? I have four more minutes and I will try to go quickly through this fourth law proposal, which is building on top the laws of foundations in Malta. Uh, a legal person, as you know much better than me, uh, is defined in terms of, uh, of a purpose. And uh, it uh, needs, it gets like a legal capacity if it's able to have a patrimony, which then becomes the basis of liability. And we have this particular legal person, person that is the Purpose Foundation. Um, and in particular, the Purpose Foundation is ownerless or non-proprietary, there is no real uh, person behind it. And this clearly matches very nicely to, to the, the notion we have of a DAO. There is no real person behind the DAO. Yes, maybe a foundation has a governance structure, but the governance structure uh, is uh, very well uh, represented, I'll just fast forward here, it's very well represented by the software that the DAO has. So the governance function is there, but the governance structure is not no longer uh, a group of people, but is recognized as uh, the, the, the automation provided by the software itself. So the only real thing that we need to resolve here is how does this legal person build a patrimony? Because if we're able to do that, then we already have the uh, legal structures to recognize uh, this entity as, as a legal person. Well, uh, this can be done basically in, uh, in three ways that all require the intervention of the designer. And this also explains why these laws are voluntary. They cannot be mandated. The designer has to exercise a choice and uh, encode in the DO these uh, features, attributes, behaviors, uh, uh, aspects. And in particular, one uh, behavior or feature this entity must have is that of uh, providing a basis of patrimony. This can be done on creation where it offers a guarantee. There is uh, some uh, uh, fund available to cover damages. This can be done 
in terms of a sinking fund that collects transactions uh, partially as they happen and builds up the patrimony. Uh, this can be done as insurance, in particular, automated insurance through, through decentralized insurance services. Uh, you see, we see here that through these mechanisms, we are building up uh, a patrimony, and therefore, if something goes bad, we have something to, to get at. And this, again, requires, and I, I cannot stress this enough, requires the active choice of the designer. So maybe the question becomes, why would a designer do this? Well, I think that if you look at it from the perspective of an investor or a consumer, and I have two DAOs or technology arrangements which are exactly equivalent, but one of them offers legal personality and the guarantees of a legal personality, which one would I choose? probably the one that has legal personality because I am more guaranteed. So this is the incentive for the designer. By designing these behaviors into the technology, he will ensure, he or she will ensure, will have better odds that the technology will be adapt, adopted by, by the investors and the consumers. And basically that's all in my presentation. And before I open the q and I just want to remind you that if you want to follow this more uh, interactively, please feel free to join my new online community for building the blockchain business and most of the blockchain island. It's uh, my blockchain island club. And uh, there you also have some of the regulators who are uh, participating and answering questions as well. Thank you. And now I will stop the screen share and go back. Thank you, Steve. Uh, well, it's a great presentation uh, right now. Um, uh, we're gonna, we don't have time actually for questions right now. I would love, I have, you know, like a five questions I already put. Um, maybe we can do five minutes of questions if, if we can, okay, and close here. And we can always uh, keep going on in the after hours here. <laughs> Um, okay, so MG, you're in the chat. I'm not checking the chat right now. I have one from my, all my questions. I have one uh, that I'm gonna uh, try now. But MG, if you have any questions on the chat, let us know after Steve uh, answers this. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, uh, what is a blow mine is the oracles and legal personality. That's something that uh, is hard to understand for everyone. Um, and uh, going to the basic, uh, we talk about the, the, let's go to the basics better because this is too complicated for issuers, okay, of the VFA. Uh, you say that the custodian is optional. And I know you have uh, said during all the presentation at the end that the designers uh, all, all is voluntary. All this, um, you know, the structure is making it voluntary for the designer. But uh, for the issue of the VFA, the custodian is optional. Should it be mandatory in your opinion? A custodian it is not optional, but mandatory? So we, we must make the distinction between uh, a VFA, a virtual financial asset, and uh, anything else which uh, would qualify as a financial instrument uh, according to MIFID. Um, in the US, we, we hear this notion of the STO, the security token offering. Uh, we don't call it like that, but we recognize that there can be not the VFA, but a DLT asset, which qualifies as a financial instrument. And in that case, all the rules of MIFID apply, and therefore you will have to have a custodian. So that case is entirely covered. But we must also clearly understand, and this is something that I cannot stress enough, that the reason why the VFA, the virtual financial assets, is a is being like identified and def defined 
is that it is a new kind of thing that we have never ever seen before. Why? Because it is programmable, it is smart, it can change behavior during its, uh, its own life cycle. And it becomes like the foundational stone for everything else that we are trying to build into the laws in terms of number one, recognizing that there are these technology arrangements, and number two, that these can be so uh, strange as the DAOs that they become autonomous and self-sufficient. So it is a building, like a, a stepping stone towards the, this, this uh, uh, attempt at, at creating, trying to create a legal space for these new, uh, new entities. Good, good. Thanks. Uh, NJ, anything on the chat? Uh, we got one from Ventapula. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, asking about. Um, oh, and you might have to you might have to speak up and identify if this is if I'm interpreting it right. But uh, it says in case of. A, a blockchain company specializing in real estate assets uh, tokenization would like to establish in Malta a security token. So he, and he's asking, what is the term of incorporation, um, legal approximate costs, and about how long would this take to do? Yeah, I think Steve did the disclosure at the beginning. He is not an attorney, and this is not for to do give legal legal <laughs> advice but to show you the strategy of the block chain that he presented to the government right steve yes i uh, uh I, I i'm not in, in a position to give any sort of legal advice in terms of timing i think that uh, uh, one reflection has to to come to mind here um Times can be long. Uh, why? Not so much because the process by itself needs a long time. It, uh, it can take, relatively speaking, very short. But the problem is that we are, we are here in Malta, we are being uh, drowned by demand, literally. There are so many companies coming here that the queue, that you have to stay in line be before you, you get attention, you are serviced, uh, is is becoming a real uh, a real uh, concern. Uh, of course, if you have uh, uh, clients that want to come to Malta, I can like guide you in helping you to get to the appropriate uh, uh, corporate legal service providers, and then they will be able to answer these questions much more appropriately. But keep in mind, the uh, the waiting line is is growing by the minute. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I don't know you all that have been in other activities, but this keynote have been amazing. That's what I think, you know. Um, thank thank you. you very much uh, for being here with us. We're gonna still, you know, we're gonna keep going with this because there's a lot of questions even before your your presentation. So we're gonna be talking about Malta. I think more than ever. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, you all. Um, uh, so see you next session. Bye bye. 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 Thanks, Steve.